Hello and a very warm welcome to the Shackles Are Off podcast. I hope that you enjoyed Ollie Pope last time around. He was very good, wasn't he? Very good indeed. Nice to talk to him. So we're going from the young to the old, and I'm sure that our guest won't like us saying that, but he is, let's face it. Um, Phil the Freitas is on this week, and with Jack Brooks and Chris Millard, and... Uh, Brooksy, you're, I mean, basically, you're a mobile at the moment, aren't you? And you sat in your pants and uh, you can't really do a great deal else. Sorry, I'm revealing a little bit too much here. But um, how are you? First, you know, I am concerned for your well being, actually. Yeah, as long as you don't want me to prove that I'm just sat in my pants, mate. Thanks for that. Yeah, I, I, um... I've already seen. It's fine. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to see here, mate. Um, yeah, I'm just obviously recoast, recoast, uh, recovering. <laughs> Recovering post surgery, mate. So I'm, um, yeah, I've had both my Achilles sort of fixed. And how, my, how many working um, limbs do you have? Uh, I'm currently have one working limb, my left hand, which is useless to me at the best of times. So it's getting better at <laughs> Monday yes. time. Now, but um, yeah, all good, boys. To be honest, I'm in a positive frame of mind. Um, next few weeks will be challenging, but. We'll get there in the end. There's obviously worse going on in the world, and it's not. I'm not really missing much with my feet. No, I was going to say, you know, like to be sat there with both feet like lifted up in the air for however long. You've picked a bloody good time to have it done, by the way, haven't you? Whilst nobody's. Yeah. It's uh, it's one of those things. Don't you? you take your opportunities when they come along, don't you? But um, <laughs> I've needed them doing. Certainly needed the Achilles doing for a while. It's getting to the point now where they were affecting me um, yeah. on the field during the cricket season. My, my thumb was a bit of a freak injury, which just sort of was annoying, but that would be all right. Um, so I'm looking at it short term pain, long term gain a minute, boys, but the ferret would be back up and running 100% by the new year, hopefully. So. Have you gotten to the stage yet where you're flicking and you're watching like a 2002 version of Top Gear? Are you at that <laughs> stage yet or not? I haven't gone too far back with the classics yet. I've completed a few different shows. Cobra Kai was done in a couple of days. Nice. Um, I read James Haspel's autobiography in a couple of days. Um, I don't know if that's the quality of his writing or the size of his book. I don't know, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's um, I'm, I'm choosing things to, to fly through. Um, obviously, my girlfriend's here as well, so she's been furloughed. Well, not furloughed, but off work for a few weeks. So yeah, we'll probably watch a few shows together and get through it together. I need a carer, so I need to be with someone. Well, I did offer when I was in London, but you deserted me, so it was uh, fine. Yeah, no offense, Greggy. You, no offense. you can't look after yourself, mate. That is true. I need a carer, there's nothing wrong with me. Um, I think you, um, also, I think if you are a listener, I think you should um, send in some recommendations for Brooksy over the next few weeks. Yeah, and uh, any listening. good shows or films. I'm a big fan of 80s films. Um, wow, that's niche. That's niche. I mean, for a start, people have got to listen to our podcast, which is a small pool anyway. And then they've also got to uh, like their 80s films and know them and want to tell you them. So I, I, I'm not expecting... Mate, there's going to be response. millions of people out there. Millions of people. <laughs> literally millions sending in, sending in emails to watch The Goonies and Karate Kid and things like that. So. <laughs> the Goonies. <laughs> I love it. Um, so also as well, Cricket Fix is coming because... Um, well, we didn't really know where England were going to be going, but the going to South Africa, little mini white ball tour in the bubble, that starts, depending on when we put this podcast out, in sort of a couple of weeks' time-ish. But anyway, it's in November, so you get a bit of a cricket fix, which is great stuff as well. The Barmy Army front, Chris, uh, busy? I mean, I'm guessing not, because, you know, there's no Barmy Army going anywhere, but still keeping things ticking along nicely. And a um, bit of junior membership news as well. Yeah, fairly, fairly steady, as you can imagine, with um, no live sport to go to still for the foreseeable future. But we are currently working reduced hours across the board with a full staff team. So if you have got an inquiry coming to Barmy Army HQ, please be patient with us. But we will answer you um, for certain on the info at email or on the phone. But yeah, we are focusing on our junior membership program as we want to get it out to a wider audience because we think it's a great product it's partnered with the root academy to give exclusive coaching tips to our pool of junior members they get a new balance barmy army shirt which is really cool and a little drawstring bag and a host of other benefits that are all available at barmyarmy.com it's only 25 pound per year it's a perfect christmas present and you need to get ordering now to make sure you get it in time for christmas so if you are listening and you've got a someone under the age of 18 you fancy a lovely little niche present for Christmas, then let's hope they choose us. 
sounds good that actually sounds really good those root academy tips are really good actually i was watching a, a, a leg spin one and it did me i mean absolutely no help whatsoever but it was it was really good that's nothing but to you, do with but the you, of the you have taken wickets at newland before so. i have two for at newland thank you very much yeah so uh brooks he's shaking his head he's thinking look at you you idiot wait um, ask who you're bowling at mate but um i was going to ask then obviously you've had a that's your experience so you've got a cool little story about playing at Newlands or being in Newlands or a cricket story. Yeah. Maybe maybe any of the Barmy Army listeners could contact us for the next pod of their highlights of a, of a trip to South Africa on field or off field if they've got any funny or interesting stories for Great yeah, shout. I love that. Yeah, I like shout. that. I like that a lot. Maybe maybe if Millard picks the best one, he could send them a Barmy Army shirt. The best one. We will yeah, we will give a Barmy Army face mask to the best story. Nice. Very we'll useful at the moment. And make sure you send your addresses as well. With what, your yeah, what, do that. Sorry, email address, then, Millard. What's the email address? Info at barmyarmy.com. Yeah. Okay. Right, Philip De Freitas. Then, I mean, we're gonna we're, we're gonna have a good old long chat with him. I think. And um, what I mean, Brooksy, presumably in the nineties when you were watching cricket, he's like you know numero uno, isn't he? He's like he's a, he's a good man, wasn't he, Phil, Phil De Freitas, to, yeah, to watch and sort of model yourself on. Top player, top player. Was, um... He bowled quite quick, used to whack it, really good fielder. Um, pr- pretty cool name as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, he'll say that he was brought up in London, but I think he was um, was actually born in the West Indies, so he's hopefully got a pretty good story for us on that. Um, listen, he was a top man. He played for a long time, took over 1,200 first-class wickets, played for 20 years, like unbelievable career. Um, and some, some of the old school will always have some good stories as well, so I'm looking forward to some some good off-field stories from him. But yeah, this would be a really good pod for us out there, particularly with um, his, his background. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Pick his brains on all sorts. And uh, very good talker. Seen him a bit on the telly in the summer. He's also got two of the best stats ever um, for Cricket Tip. But I'll put those to him in the podcast when we get talking to him. And it's Philip De Freitas on the Shackles Are Off podcast. Okay. Uh, basically, we, we start off by asking all of our players, what got you into cricket? Because everybody always has a different kind of journey, but essentially it's because yeah. they like it. So what was okay. what was your path? Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange one because you know, my first love really is, is football. And uh, I played football and, and in the winter just played football and, and, and the summer cricket. Uh, but if I, if I had to choose, I would have to choose football. Uh, <laughs> it sounds strange really. And it's only... As a kid, as Brooksy said, you know, watching the likes of myself, you know, playing that sort of got him into cricket. Um, I started watching, you know, the great West Indies sides in the 80s, early 80s. Um, and then, you know, sort of uh, I started to play uh, a bit of cricket, enjoyed it. Um, but I was never really a, a, a sort of a, a team player in a sense, really, because I was very shy, very, um, you know, I, I kept myself to myself and I always felt that. Um, if I played cricket, I might, might embarrass myself. I did something wrong, people would laugh at me and whatever. You, but it, it was one of those things, really. But I, I enjoyed playing football. I enjoyed playing cricket. Um, and then just did both of them, really. And that was it. Uh, and I got to a stage where uh, playing football, the, the actual coach of the club side I played for, which was Sudbury Court um, in Wembley, near Wembley, um, he, he decided, well, you know, I'm going to write to to Luton Town because I think this kid can play it. The thing I didn't realise, I knew I knew John Barnes played for the same club I did, Sudbury Court. So wow. two years before that, he took John Barnes to Watford. Oh, brilliant, right. Yeah, yeah, so it's the same club, really, basically. And uh, he took me along to Luton. I played a couple of games to Luton, loved it. Uh, and the same football club, which was the same Creek club I played for, in the summer, uh, one of the second third eleven captains wrote to Lords and I think one of the guys worked at Lords he gave him the letter and said take it into Lords MCC ground staff um, because I think it's worth you know myself really me, me, me most probably thought I deserved a bit of a trial so I went on that trial MCC ground staff and at first I didn't get in I, I didn't get in at first um, you know, I, I remember getting on the train and getting to St John's Wood station and as I'm coming off the train, you know, sort of at the station, who do I bump into? It was Phil Tufnell. Oh, really? Tough as, tough as and I, we both, uh, we were going for this MCC ground staff trials. And I looked at Tuffers and, you know, we both had jeans and T-shirts and just a bit of a plastic bag, basically, boots in there. And 
you know, didn't really have much of you know, any kick, to be fair. And we, tur we turned up for this trial. MCC came through the game. The bloke says, you know, what are you here for? I said, we're here for the MCC ground staff trial. And he looked at us and he must have thought, no, you don't belong here, mate. <laughs> you know, how we were dressed. But we eventually got in. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure there's about nearly 100 boys, basically. I'm, you know, there's so many. Um, so we had the trials. Uh, I went home. Then, you know, at first, I, I didn't think I got in. Nothing was said to us. Um, I went home. I said to my mum, no, I don't think I've got in. Then I got a message saying that, you know, Luton are quite interested in, you know, giving me a bit of an apprenticeship contract. Um, yeah. So I went, oh, great. You know, no problem. And a week later, Don Wilson apparently spoke to Colonel Stevenson and said, look, I think this kid needs to go on the MCC ground star. Then I was given... <laughs> then I was given an MCC ground staff contract. So I had to choose basically football or cricket. But wow. deep down, I always felt I was a better cricketer than I was a footballer. But people thought it was the other way around. But, uh, you know, I had no regrets. And, uh, and yeah. that was it, really. Uh, and it just went on from there. I mean, look, you know, you, you, you played for England. Was it probably a year, about 12 months after you made your first class debut? So I'd say that's probably not a bad decision because I'm not sure that you've been getting an England call up, uh, for, you know, for the football. You never know. You could have made it into that Italian 90 squad if you'd have. If you'd have. <laughs> Who knows, but that's a, it was a good, good decision, though, that, Phil, wasn't it? You know, it, really, if you think about it. And it was like quite a quick, you know, thrusting yeah. into the England team, really. Yeah, it was. It, you know, it was a, it's, it's a strange one, really, because, you know, like you said, it was a good decision. And I, you know, I, I do, you know, I love cricket and I love football and, and it, to make a, you know, a decision on one or the other. But I, I think deep down you have to make the, you know, you have to say, right, OK, what's right? And I made the right choice at the end. You know, I had no regrets. I made the right choice. But what was strange about it was I got on to MCC, MCC ground staff and the first year, you know, you do your ground staff duties like the scoreboards and sell school cards to MCC members and so on. And then you get to practice and sometimes you get to bowl to MCC members at the end of the day, which is the last thing you want to do, really, after spending all day there and MCC members queuing up to, you know, you know, to have a bat against you. But I made sure, you know, even Tuffers and I remember one day Tuffers and I were both doing it where Colonel Stevenson rucked up for a net and it was sort of end of the day and you think, I want to get home here. So Tuffers and I both decided, right, when he comes in, we're just going to pelt him. We're going to just bowl him bounces after bounces. Even Tuffers was bowling bounces. <laughs> they were no, and we, and we, we were never asked again. That was it. <laughs> yeah, did the trick, basically. We were never asked to bowl at members again. But being on the MCC ground, so you play against county second teams. Um, so that gave me an opportunity to be seen. So I remember going up to Leicester, playing against Leicester. I'll never, you know, never forget it, really. We drove up to Leicester, and it's the first time I've been out of London, basically, in a sense. And as we drove up, I remember going in Mark Blackett, who was on the MCC ground staff as well. And he drove, as we got into Leicester, and there's, I just had this feeling that it was just strange. It felt, it felt you know, weird, but in a, in, a nice, in a nice way. And it felt like home and strange. You know, I had that feeling again. And as we drove into Grace Road, that same feeling again. And we played, we played at, um, you know, Grace Road against, I remember Jonathan Agnew, Gordon Parson, and all these guys were playing. Um, and, and, I, and I did okay, did all right against Leicestershire, sat in the change room. And, you, you know, you have those thoughts in your mind, you're looking out, the, you know, on the ground, you're thinking, wow, this is, you know, this is what it's all about, really. Knock on the door, Ken Higgs comes in and said, we'd like to give you a couple, we'd like you to come play a couple of trial games for us. And I was like, wow, you know. You know, sort of really weird, that sort of weird. Yeah. Oh, wow, but exciting. Great. But Don Wilson said I had to go back to, to Lords and speak to, I think it was Tim Lamb, who was chief exec at Middlesex then, because being on the ground staff, uh, Middlesex had his first pick. You know, so I was Middlesex boy. So I went in to see Tim Lamb and I said, look, you know, Leicester have offered me a couple of trial games. What, you know, is that OK? And he went, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I went along, played. I literally played, I remember playing against Worcestershire and Graham Hick was playing. Hickey was playing and, you know, he was qualifying, he was playing. And again, I didn't do anything major. You know, played okay, all right, no problem. Um, and as we were batting, I stood in the change room there. I remember watching that, watching the game, stood in the change room and tap on the shoulder. Ken Higgs came up and said, we'd like to offer you a two-year contract. Wow. So I was like, wow, wow gone from MCC ground stuff, you know, sort of trial game, contract. 
And I went, yeah, yeah, great, sounds great. But I have to go back down to London to speak to, you know, Middlesex again. I have to speak to Don Wilson firstly, and then I have to speak to um, Tim Lamb. Went back down to London, spoke to Don Wilson. He said, lad, just go and speak to Tim, you know, go and speak to Tim Lamb. So I went into the office, I spoke to Tim Lamb, sat there and I said, look, um, Leicester offered me a contract for Middlesex looking to do anything with me. And he said, well, to be honest, looking at the Middlesex first team, it's very strong, can't see you getting in there. Looking at the second team, you had people like Angus Fraser, Kevin James, all these guys <laughs> coming through. It says, we can't see you breaking into that either. So I went, all right, great. So basically, I, well, I just went, excuse me, I went to bollocks then, see you later. <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah. ran, ran, ran Ken Higgs and said to Ken Higgs, right, okay, mate, I'll sign. You know, I'll sign for you. Signed. And literally, as you said it, you know, I had the first season I was 12th man, um, sort of went round with the team 12th man. He, um, David Gower thought, brilliant. I was brilliant in the field. So he'd take me along as 12th man. And eventually I made my debut. And that winter, I went over to Australia to work. I played for Port Adelaide, really worked hard at my cricket, really tough cricket, serious tough cricket, took it seriously. Came back home, had a fantastic season. Um, you know, I nearly took 100 first class wickets and nearly scored 1,000 runs. So I had a wonderful season, selected, and then I suddenly I'm selected to, you know, to play for England, to get, go on to on it uh, with England. So it all happened just like that without even thinking about it, really. That's a fantastic story, Daffy. Did you, when you started, like, when you got off of your contract and you first started, did you ever think, this is me for a career for 20, however many years you played, or do you think, oh, I'm just going to try and enjoy it, even if it's only just a year or so? Yeah, it's... it. I, I just want, I wanted to be a professional sportsman, you know, football, cricket, whatever it may be. I just, I, I love sport. At school, my reports were, if I put as much effort in the classroom as I do in sport, I would be absolutely fantastic. <laughs> you know, I got in trouble at times of writing teams down and what have you. Um, so I, I was just desperate to play sport. And I never, I, I never thought, right, 20 years down the line, I, I want it to be 20 years. I just, I took, each day, and I just enjoy each day. I just enjoy being, being, you know, just a professional sportsman. Uh, and I never really looked at it that way. And, and that, to me, it was just an honour and a privilege to do that. Something I loved, and that's how, that's the attitude I took, really. Amazing, Daphne. It sounds to me like you um, you don't get phased much when you when you get an opportunity. You seem to take them. Although you say you've not done incredibly well, you seem to keep getting opportunity after opportunity. Did anything ever phase you in your early career? Um, yeah, look, don't, don't be fooled by, you know, by, you know, all this. I mean, it's, it's been a, a fantastic career. I've, I've been very, as I said, very honoured and privileged to do it for 20 years. Uh, there was loads of ups and downs. There was a lot of, um, there were times where you doubt yourself. Um, you know, like the fir my first day of pre-season at, at Leicester, um, you know, we, we turned up, we had an all-week pre-season. And I think someone said something to me. And I remember going home, um, back to London on the train and went to my mum and I said, I'm not going back. Really? I literally yeah. said that was the first week of pre-season. Someone, someone said something to me. I can't remember what it was, but someone said something to me and I, it upset me. And I went home that week and I said to my mum, I'm not going back. And I literally on this uh, Friday, I got home. Saturday, I said, no, I'm not going. And my mum said, look, have a think about it because I know this is what you love and this is what you wanted to do. Um, and then the Sunday I, morning, I woke up and I still, I wasn't going back. That was it. I wasn't, I decided I wasn't going back. And then at lunchtime, um, my mum chatted to me again and she said, what do you think? And I went, mum, I can't let this stop me. And I got on the train and went back, but I had moments like that, you know, sort of like you said, you know, face, there's, there's loads of, um, yeah. moments, especially, you know, play for England as well. Um, you know that people don't know about it. You know, times you you know you've played and you've say you've not done well or something bad's written about you. Um, you know, back in those days, you didn't really get any support. You're all on your own. Yeah. Um, and I used to at times. I used to. I remember staying in my house, um, just afraid to go out. You know, because of what's been written about me. Wow. Uh, so I went through. I went through loads. There's, there's loads of things I went through, and but. I think you've just got to be really strong and, you know, and, and I used to think, you know, I always used to say, right, this is what I want to do. This is, this is what I love. And, you know, and I've just got to try and get through it. 
Uh, and there were some really dark, you know, dark moments throughout my career. And and I think you just, without the support around you, why the players do now, Brooks will tell you, you've got that support around you now. You wouldn't have that. And you had to sort of do things on your own. And, and there are times where, you know, it was a horrible place to be. But, you know, you just, you just get on with it. Stronger for it, though, I'm guessing, sort of coming out the back of it. But then you, you also look and the game is different. It's sort of a lot of the ex-players that we've talked to, I mean, in contrast, we had Oli Pope on last week. He was obviously yeah. only 22, 23. Yeah. And then we talked to some old guy, you know, Paul Nixon, of course, yeah. who you know very well. And we they sort of say, yeah, it was very different. You know, going into a dressing room, it was very much kind of, who's this lad? And there was no kind of, oh, yeah. you know, come on, that arm around you kind of thing, really. Mm. And I, I, I'm guessing the game's changed for the better throughout your career. You know, you've seen that old school and it's sort of, you've, you've sort of transcended into the new school in, in, in a way. So better or worse? I'm, I think I probably know the answer to that. Uh, it's definitely better without a question of a doubt. Um, you know, I was very fortunate again, played in the old school, uh, the old school days with some fun days as well. <laughs> they were good we fun days, weren't they? I bet you got some good stories from those days. Yeah, which, you, which you wouldn't do. Uh, well, and the new school, you know, the 12 month contract, the fitness, the training, and all that. And I, I just think, you know, how the cricket's gone is absolutely fantastic. And it's great. It's great to see the players have been looked after well, being paid well, and treated like professionals, That's a, which we are. You know, and, and they are basically. Um, so I think the, you know, the, the, the way the cricket's gone is, 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 is absolutely fantastic. There's, there's only one thing I, you know, I would say is a, a lot of, a lot of, you know, the new, uh, the way cricket is at the moment, you know, coaching with youngsters, I'm still involved coaching with youngsters. I just like a lot of more, more from the youngsters, really a bit for more, you know, sort of two way, you know, with the coaching and, and all that. And I think, you know, people need to come forward rather than being sat there and said, right, what are we doing today? I think it's got to be both ways. That's the only thing I would change a little bit. You've got to start thinking for yourself as well. Because once you go out there, no one's holding your hands. You've got to do it yourself. So um, that's the only thing I would say needs, you know, sort of look, you know, be looked at a little bit more. It's a little bit too much information going one direction. It needs to be both direction, I reckon. That's the yeah, only thing. completely agree with that, Duff. Um... One thing I want to talk to you about was because I grew up watching cricket in the 90s and it was such a mad era for English cricket, wasn't it? Like yeah. a mix of um, some really talented individuals that but the team never really got the results, arguably because, you know, other teams were really good, particularly Australia and the back end of the West Indies. Um, what was it like playing? Because the majority of your career was in the 90s, wasn't it? In the back end of the 80s into the yeah. 90s. And you had the, one of the, you probably were one of those guys that had the tag of like new Botham, Sort of all round attack. So how old was it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've heard you were. I've heard you were a decent boozer as well. But we don't have to go into that if you don't want to. Um, yeah, sort of the the tag of the sort of the new both of, and also what was it like playing for England in the nineties? Because it was probably a lot of fun, but mad as well. I'd have thought with you know in and out of the team. Even though you played a lot of cricket in, for England in the end, over one hundred and fifty appearances, wasn't it? Um, what was it like? Well, I think you you nailed it really when you said with great individuals, but not not great as a team. And I and a lot of that I think start you know started really with county cricket, um, where I looked at Leicestershire, you know where I first started Leicestershire on paper, fantastic team, you know you you know sort of the names and so on. We we never seemed to play as a team. It was more the individuals. Yeah. And, and I left, well, when I left Leicestershire to go to Lancashire, I wanted to go to a team that, you know, that were going to win trophies and play at the test ground and so on. And you always had this uh, tag or, you know, people always said that you left for the money. You went for the money. And I actually went to, because I wanted to win trophies, I wanted to go to Lord's Fine. I wanted to be, you know, play as a, as a team, basically. Leicester, great, you know, great individuals, you know, fantastic, you know, though you said on paper, team on paper, but those are the reasons I left. Now, going into the England setup, again, um, you know, what people forget is when you played for England, you played, if you played a test match, you were paid something like two, three grand for the test match. If you didn't play, you didn't earn that money. Yeah. And if you, the same with the one day, one day international. So if you, you know, there was no central contract. So, 
basically what you had players coming into the England side. So if you had 12, 13 players coming into the England side and you're playing and, and you're in that team, you're playing, you're earning the money. If you're not playing, you're not earning the money. And what it created, you created basically, is, I, I, th- I, I th- call it selfishness, really, because you're playing to, so yourself can be in that team, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know if you don't perform, you're out. So it was a bit that way, really. And I always felt there was little clicks as well. I always felt there was clicks. And, and, I, and I always think that people are playing for themselves. And, 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 the, and you, what you do, you find yourself trying so hard, really hard, because you're desperate to do well. You're desperate to stay in the England side. One, you're being paid for it. Secondly, you just really want to be in that team because you know one bad performance, you're out. Someone else comes in. Um, and it was, it, was, it, was, it was horrible at times. It was tough. And I mentioned it was fun. There were some fun times. Uh, but playing for England was really, really hard because you're in and out. And I can, you know, I can tell you most probably know I've dropped 14 times. Really? 14, yeah. I was dropped wow. 14 oh, times. Wow. And every time I was dropped... You know, to get back in, I wasn't sort of grab, you know, some sort of grab and said, mate, you need to go and do this. You need to go and do that. You need to work. There was nothing said. You, I just literally got in, you know, got in the car, went back to my county, worked my backside off, tried to perform and get back in. Uh, so it was a bit like that, really. And I, I always felt that's where, you know, if England played as a team, if we really, as, as you can see now, what's happened, especially with the World Cup and everything else, because you've got the central contract and you and everyone's, you know, playing, you know, and there, there's no individuals basically. If we did that in the nineties, I think would have been more successful. But the other thing, you've got to remember, I personally, I personally believe I played against most of the best Australian side, the best West Indian side, and most probably the best Pakistan side ever as well. So I played against, you know, and you can go with the Sri Lankans as well. So I'm most, I, I personally think I played against, you know, the, the greatest. So. If I look back at my career, okay, okay, you know, we might not have won so many test matches, but I think I played and performed against the best that's ever been, I reckon. Yeah. That's um, fun as well, isn't it? That's fun. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So pl- playing cricket in, in, cricket in the 90s for England was an absolute nightmare, mate. Absolute <laughs> nightmare. You didn't, know if you, you didn't know if you're coming or going, honestly. So just, just, um, to, just to flip that on to the positive yeah. side of playing cricket for England yeah. in the 90s, though, <laughs> um, we spoke about it off air earlier. The inception of the Barmy Army and the, the fun that you had off the field, that was really the first time it was well documented in the 90s that how, how much fun you had in the, in the bars as well. Is that right? <laughs> it was, yeah. As we spoke off there early doors, um, it, it all started. I remember '92 World Cup in Australia, and uh, the Barmy Army were there to support us. And I'll never forget the best atmosphere ever when we played Australia in Sydney, and it was a full house. And I reckon 90% of the supporters were Barmy Army or English. You know, the, and the national anthem was sang, and we all stood, and I went cold. And I remember sat, stood next to Neil Fairbrother, and we sing, and we went cold. And it was so passionate, and we stuffed them that day. It was brilliant, great support. But during that '92 World Cup, every game we played, we went. You know, afterwards, the Barmy Army would be there. We'd, you know, after the game, we'd see the guys, supporters. We would talk to them. We'd say, "Where are you going drinking?" And I said, "We're going to this bar, and we'll go in there and have a drink with them." So it was, you know, it was fun. It was great. It was great support. It was fantastic being with those guys as well. So, yeah. So, you know, on the positive side, it was great. It was great fun. <laughs> what was his song, um, Millard? Do you know what Daffy's song was? I, I don't know. I think it was just, oh, Philip the Freighters. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was that, sung on repeat many times. But I think there wasn't... The songwriting back in the 90s it wasn't anywhere near what it is now. <laughs> it, was, it, it shifted a bit over the 25 yeah. years. So. Yeah. But they were great. I mean, they were great support, and you knew they were there. They were, you know, and, and that was the great thing about it, really. Um, and as I said, you know, I'd going out and having a drink with the guys and talking to them, socialising with them, um, you know, that was one thing that we enjoyed and we loved. And yeah, I suppose it's a bit like you know, if you're looking to scratch that footballer itch, it's almost this that that's as close as you're going to get as a cricketer, isn't it? And playing in front of a packed house and everyone's going a bit mental and singing your name and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Best of yeah, both absolutely. worlds. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to talk to you about some stats, right? So I, I think these are two of my favourite stats ever, and they both belong to you, right? 
hundredth player to take a hundred test wickets. That's a nice one. And also, I, this baffles me. Only player to take a five for against every county. Wow. Brooks has got a chance, I mean, isn't he? You've got to be so <laughs> proud of that. Brooks, have you got a chance of that? Ah, uh, mate, two divisions. You don't play all the teams all the time, do you? Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> plus, 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 I'm probably not as good as him. But also, <laughs> that's a serious stat. But I can't believe it hasn't been done since. Like, obviously, the two divisions wouldn't help. But to be the only person that's done that, it's crazy, really. It is. It is madness. It is absolute madness. But um, you know, I moved from Leicester to Langs and Langs to back to Derby and Leicester. So. Yeah, and I suppose that's helped me as well doing that. And it was frowned upon, you know, if you move counties, um, you know, and I always move. I moved because I think it was a time to the right time to move. And obviously, there were circumstances why I moved. But um, you, you know, once once my you know sort of England career was coming towards the end, and I knew it, and I felt it. Um, I set myself new goals, and part of my new goals was trying to get. Um, over a thousand first class wickets and try and score 10,000 runs. And I sort of, and, I, and to be honest, the Fifers, I never really thought about those. I just played and that was it until, it's not until the end of my career when people were talking about, you, do you realise you're the only one? And I went, oh, hi, great, thank you. Um, <laughs> and I didn't, you know, I sort of, I never, never really thought about those things. I, and I, I never aimed about, you know, sort of making sure I'm the only one who gets Fifer. I just played. You play as you, you know, you play against each county. Um, and you just, you know, you try and perform to the best of your ability, really. And that's it. There's, that nothing wrong with playing. There's nothing wrong with playing for three counties, by the way, Duffy. Absolutely, <laughs> mate. Yeah. You're, you're, challenging, you're challenging yourself, mate. You know, it's, it's all right to stay in one place and be secured and everything's great. To ch you challenge yourself. And I think sometimes some cricketers get stale and they need to move. They need a fresh challenge. And that, you know, that gets you going again. And, uh, you know, I, I don't see anything wrong with it, to be honest. Yeah, it certainly keeps you on your toes and embracing right. different cultures. Amazing how different counties operate and different personalities yeah. in different areas of the country. You've obviously played mainly in the Midlands and up north, didn't you? But yeah. I've been sort of north, Midlands, west, different breed everywhere. But yeah, <laughs> and you are that lovely, Brooksy. Still going, and that's a, that's the main thing. Well, you were were you thirty nine, forty when you finished? Thirty nine, thirty nine. One of my memories of you was watching a. It might have been like a Sunday League or a Pro 40. I don't know if, if it was back then. You and Devon Malcolm opened the bowling for Leicester and the combined age was over 80, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Granddad's 11. <laughs> but it was brilliant because like, you were still both bowling on a sixpence. At, you know, Dev was certainly still decent pace. I can't remember yeah. what your pace was back then, but it would have been all right. Um, and at the top level, top game, you got these two old dudes showing how it's done. You must have made you pretty proud that. Yeah, it was. I mean, the, again, it was, It was. you know, when we, you, you're sort of playing at that age and there was always, are you guys still playing? You know, is it time to hang, you know, and we just, we just kept saying, well, we're still performing and we're still fit enough, still perform. And it shows you with the likes of sort of Jimmy Anderson, international level wise, keep yourself fit and you're still performing. Why, you know, why should you be left out the side? I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy's still, you know, one of the best, you know, most probably the best yeah. in the world. So why why should you step aside when you're still you've still got it? And I, I just felt that way. And I thought, you know, I will go as long as I can. Um, and then you know, you will know yourself when it's time to go. You know it's you know. Um, and it, it was just one of those things. And we 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 you know we we carried on, we looked after ourselves as far as fitness wise and you know, that helped us to to have long careers basically. Didn't drink enough off field, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was the early days. That was the early days. <laughs> who was your Who was your favourite roommate back in the early days? Oh, mate, look, you know, um, I, again, I, I tell the story where I was very, very fortunate to have, you know, to room. My first England roommate was my hero, was Ian Botham. <laughs> and, wow. um, you know, you, 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 you're watching them, you're watching these guys and you think, wow, you know. As it talks about the early West Indies side, you know, great side, you know, thinking, God, I'd love to play against these guys one day, you know. And next thing you know, you're sharing room. You're watching both. You're sharing room with your hero. My first two weeks in 
in Brisbane, in Australia, on the Ashes tour, my first roommate, Ian Botham, for two weeks. And then the next two weeks, I've got Alan Lamb. Yeah. <laughs> Contrast. <laughs> so, your smile says it all, mate. <laughs> uh, listen, I those four weeks were the most unbelievable four weeks of my life. I bet you grew up quickly in uh, those four weeks. Oh, it was it was amazing. It was fa- oh, it was fantastic, and it was the first you know first month of the tour basically, where we trained and we just played a few uh, state games and country games, both from Lamb Goward. They didn't give a monkeys about those games, and it was literally you know the guys were partying really, enjoying themselves, <laughs> and I'm thinking this is great. This is <laughs> this is fantastic. Uh, we had you know we had such a you know I. Those four, those four weeks, yeah, of the start of the tour was just incredible, and it got better. It absolutely got better. So you talked about my roommates. I mean, these guys, uh, you know, sharing room with with both of them. You know, sort of my idol basically, and it, it was incredible. It was incredible. Lammy and then Lammy is just <laughs> saying no more, really. Um, but you, you talk about your favourite roommates, you know. I, uh, MCC ground stuff, you know, with toughers. I brewed with toughers. They were exciting, interesting times. How about uh, yeah. Neil Fairbrother, you know, a good mate of mine. Um, so, yeah, there, there was different rumours. And then I think we got to the stage where you started getting your own rooms then. Um, but early doors, um, that tour with, you know, sharing room, those two. I mean, we, we started that tour where we couldn't win a game. We did not win a game the first month. But everyone was partying. Everyone's having a laugh, having a drink. It was great. We had Elton John following us, by the way. He was with us all the time. <laughs> and uh, so you, you come back from training, you go in the tea room, Elton John's in there offering you a drink. Oh, cheers, Elton. <laughs> yeah, so there's one of those. Um, but every, you know, then as we moved on and the test match started, we won the test match. And, and we finished the test match and we celebrate, you know, every game we won was celebrated. And I think that's the way it should be. We celebrate the win. So we'd, we'd, we'd carry on drinking in the change room and then we'll go back to the hotel and we'll, we'd have a, you know, sort of have a few beers, enjoy ourselves. And I remember every game we won, uh, the test match won theirs, Elton would he'd lay on a party for us. He'd DJ for it. It was just, it was incredible. It was, it, it was incredible four months. And it was a shame because if we had the Barmy Army then, it would have been absolutely <laughs> madness. I can it imagine. Madness. That, that does but actually that, seem uh, the only way to this question, um, Phil. We've, we've had an informant, which I'll, I'll let you know who it is later. You probably guess from the questions, but said mention Diana Ross and see what the outcome <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what? You know, we had Boxing Day, Boxing Day test match, you know, sort of Christmas time. You have the old fancy dress. In England, it's known. It's, it's, and we all given a letter and I was given D. You know, D, and I'm thinking, oh, I was last minute, D. Uh, and so I remember going out to a fancy dress shop with Gladstone Small and uh, his missus. And so we went, uh, we walked into this, this shop and it, you know, fancy dress. And I'm looking around, I've gone, mate, I've got D. Can you sort me out something? D. And he's looking around, he says, everything's gone. Uh, there's nothing really, you know. Then he gets his big red dress out and he goes, yeah, your skin complexion. And, she's, and, the, and, and I remember this guy, you know, was, you know, very, very, very sort of, you know, he was very touchy as well. He goes, your, your skin complexion. And he says, you get rid of your little tash and we get this wig on. We've got size 10 and a half shoes here for you. Stick those on heels, high heels, get the dress on, wig on, bit of makeup. I reckon you could pass with Diana Ross, D, there you go. <laughs> and, I've, and I've gone, I've literally gone, uh, not sure about that, but. Glad his missus has gone, yeah, yeah, it'd be brilliant, Daph. brilliant, brilliant. Okay, I went, right. There's nothing, there was no other option. So got it along, no problems, gone back. Got to the hotel, next day, got ready, we gone. Glad his missus put some makeup on. She says, oh, it'd be, it'd be fantastic, just get rid of the tash. I went, no chance, I'm not getting rid of that tash, no chance. You know, back in those days, the old tash, it was, it was, you know, sort of you're proud of whatever tash you I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why horrible little things, but I don't know why. But we had it, you know. You thought you were cool then. So anyway, I put this thing on. I walked in on the media, you know, sort of, you know, Christmas morning, you know, sort of flicking away cameras. 
And everyone just focused on me with this red dress. And they're just flicking away, beefing, holding me, kissing me. And I'm like, what the, you know, thinking this is just a photo dress. <laughs> next day, next day, Boxing Day test match, you know, full house, rocked up. There was banners. We love you, Daffy. You know, Diana Ross, you know, all this. <laughs> Mate, I, oh, couldn't no. I couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you how many letters I got, but not from the people I really want to get letters from. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with numbers, names. Honestly, oh, it was, I was just, you know, I was just taken back by the whole thing. And, you know, and, and from, the, from this day, even now, you can see that a red dress comes up, Diana Ross. Uh, and that was it. And fancy dress, you know, it was just a, it was a fantastic day spending Christmas really in, in Australia on tour. Can you imagine we'd love to do our due diligence. It's, uh, <laughs> social media with that now would be amazing, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, I, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Oh dear, I love it. Oh, so funny. So yeah, one of our informants. I mean, you probably know it is. Don't well, you, you named him straight away. It was Gladdy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a belt. Absolutely yeah. belt. You know, if you were playing now, uh, Daffy, you'd absolutely la be lapping the IPL up, wouldn't you? And the franchise stuff, I reckon. You'd be, that's, you know, you were made for that kind of. <laughs> Thanks, <work>. mate. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 would have, you would have loved that, wouldn't you? I mean, you know. Yeah, I'd you be in a, that, I'd, well, oh, I wish there was something like that about when, when I was playing. Yeah, I'd be in a yacht in Barbados now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would be. Right, you'd right. be a pretty sought after play. It'd be the perfect. Sort of death bowler and guy um, who comes in and whacks bombs in the middle order. Yeah. It was, it was, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting because remember, T20 came in 2003. And, you know, what people don't realize, I played a few seasons of T20, yeah. uh, but it was towards the end of my career. And, you know, and, and I kept in Leicestershire for the first season in T20. And we got to finals day. And we lost to uh, Warwickshire and then Surrey won it, I think, that first year. Um, you know, and, and you played it, and, and what the, the amazing thing I found with T20s, you know, at first when it first came on, we all go, "Oh, not sure about this," you know, and the players and the changing, we're not sure uh, what we're talking about what song we're going to have, and so on. It was a bit weird, and eventually we just got into it, and then we found that we had a very good side. You know, you know, we had Hodge, you say, "Why all these guys?" You know, so it was fantastic. So we we got through the finals, and I started to really enjoy playing T20, uh, but. And then what I found was we played T20. There was a four-week period where we played, and then we had a week break or something like to play some other tournament. I think it might have been a 40-over game. And I remember traveling up to Yorkshire, to Headingley, to play this 40-over game. And we were batting, and I sat in the changing room, and I was going, bloody hell. You know, this game is boring. You know, <laughs> this 40-over game is so, so boring. I've never been so bored in my life. <laughs> because coming from T20 to 40 over thinking, God, this is taking forever. And yeah. it was amazing that, you know, and because the T20 goes rock up, bowl your four overs, fill for 20 overs, see you later, half a day. You know, it was brilliant. It was quick and it was, yeah, the fans in, everything was great. And then suddenly you go to that and it was like, wow, you know, this is, this is a downer really. Uh, and that's, that's the thing I found with it. But, you know, but you talk about, you know, I would have loved to, yeah, I'd love playing whatever, tournament there is cricket wise I was you know whatever it was I would have played it and I would have loved it um I I'd love to be playing IPL now seeing the way that the boys travel everywhere but the ultimate goal as I think for, for a cricketer really is to try and play for your country for England so you know it, it's one of them isn't it if you got the opportunity to go and play IPL great you get you know if you get the opportunity to play for your country you do it don't you um so yeah, I would have been. I would have loved to. Would have loved to. Um, but it would, have been, it would have been interesting to see what happened, you know, with England and you know, sort of playing IPL really as well. It's always yeah. the fielding for me that drags on in those one-day games. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they just, they just, they take. You know, as you said, you play your T20, and then suddenly you go and play a longer format of the game, and it was just like, wow, you know, is this is this for real? Um, it's it's amazing. It was a strange feeling. It's the first time it happened, and yeah. I just found it really strange. And I was talking to the guys. I'm going, God, is this boring or is it just me? <laughs> uh, and it was because yeah, I know it sounds straight. It sounds crazy because it, you you just have it. You know, short format, full house, your first time T20, Leicester, full house. Yeah, people watching you. It's great fun. It's quick, three hours, fantastic. 
and then suddenly you've got 40 overs head and you've got the old members and that's about it really and you're like well you know and you sort of keep looking at your watch thinking how long is this going on for <laughs> and, and it was one of those really until you suddenly got used to it and then you, you moved on really but uh, T20 back then was you know the one it first started it was fun it was great fun the first couple of seasons and it's moved on as you've seen it it's it's you know it's incredible it's exciting now yeah um, it's, ser- it's serious stuff now isn't it oh massive i mean you, um, you see the players the shots they play you know the bowlers it's a bowler's nightmare now you know you have to your know, school level um you know you were talked about back then coaching while you're talking about consistency bowling there you can't you know you, you won't be talking to them about consistency you've been talking about bowling different balls you know you've got to get the batters thinking you know what is he going to bowl next it's one of those now really so the game has moved on massively and also from the fielding point of view and fitness after you know it's just it's just a different level and you know and and the thing that gets me is when you get here some old players say oh this is, you know it's not the game has moved on and yeah and it's to me it's better it's more professional and, and they you know the guys the athletes now they're absolute real athletes and so it's it's great to see fantastic the um one thing i wanted to ask about was nine i think it was the 87 world cup you probably know yeah video that crops up on Twitter now and again where you're at the top of your run up running into bowl and you, and you stop to um, <laughs> speed up <laughs> basically projectile vomit all over the place um, I've always wanted to know the reasons behind that is it because you were ill or had you got something in your throat when you're running in or was it because you had a couple too many the night before with beefy <laughs> good question yeah I like that <laughs> well, it's funny enough you mentioned his name beforehand uh, Gladys Small. Gladys Small was on that, he was playing in that game. And uh, it was against West Indies, funny enough. Uh, we played in a World Cup. It was the, you know, the, 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 one of the early games against West Indies. But we stayed in this hotel in, we were in Pakistan, by the way. So to get a drink, you're going to struggle. Oh. You've got to, firstly, you've got to declare yourself an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> which I wasn't. And you're going to sign these forms. You're going to sign these forms, and then you pay something like fifty quid. Give your passport, and then you get a little can of lager or something like that. Declare yourself an alcoholic. So it wasn't worth it, basically. And the 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 day before, we train really hard, and we told look, we've got to leave quite early in the morning because we're playing. I don't know where it was. We're playing somewhere. And we've got to travel quite early, and um, we told early night food make sure you get your you know sort of breakfast thing all sorted out because it's an early start you start about nine o'clock in the morning so we're leaving the hotel about six in the morning or something like that and i've had my normal meal which was would have been a curry or something <laughs> and <laughs> about a few uh, sort of pints of water whatever you sort of thought right you know i'm pretty bored of water now i need something else i need something stronger so I had a couple of fancies. <laughs> <laughs> you rock star. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I had a couple of fancies. So fancies and then finally went to bed, forgot to put my you know, breakfast menu thing out. No breakfast. Woke up, alarm went, boom, rushed downstairs, quickly got my gear, rushed downstairs, got onto the coach, got to the ground, the warm up thing, had a bit of an energy drink or something like that. So I'm got an empty stomach here. So I'm start to, you know, sort of warm up thinking, shit, I've not had any breakfast, you know. And, you know, where nowadays there's no way that's gonna happen. But back then I sort of forgot completely. I think I might have had a banana or something like that, and then just an energy drink, and then the next thing I you know, we're bowling. And I bowled seven point whatever overs, seven point five overs, and bowling all right, bowling against Desmond Hayes and Gordon Greenwich. Doing all right there, I thought. <laughs> yeah, oh, you know, bad, bad. And I, and I ran in there and suddenly I just felt this, my stomach just felt really weird. And I literally stopped and this spew came out, this orange Fanta curry <laughs> spew came out. Oh, and I no. stood over this, I oh, stood yeah. over this spew. And then, and then I remember the physio and everyone came out and said, you okay? I said, yeah, yeah. I said, I don't know, I think it might have been the Fanta, mate. And the Fanta and the curry don't mix <laughs> together. And everyone, well, everyone thought I'd been on it and I, I haven't been, so I'm like, no, I don't feel well, you know, and suddenly I had a glass of water and physio went up, sawdust came on, finished the over and went off to fine leg. And then who's bowling the next over? Gladdy, my mate Gladdy. So Gladdy's <laughs> bowling the next over. And all I could see was Gladdy with a cricket ball and he's, you know, we're told not to lick it. 
And occasionally you, you do that, you know, somehow you can't help it. And he's doing that to the ball and he's shining it. Well, glad he didn't realise when I stood there, the ball accidentally fell in and I wiped it quickly. Oh, and there's no. my mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrendous. <laughs> We're glad he had some Fanta as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's disgusting. Oh, I know, I know. But that, 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 that was just, you know, it was... I was sick because of Fanta. Fanta and curry, that's all it was, really. And it's just a fizziness in the curry and then no breakfast. Um, and that's Happy. all. That's the reason Happy. I'm sick. Yeah. Come on, mate. You've had 30 years to think of a decent story and you come up with Fanta and bananas. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't 20, 20 pints of Cobra or Kingfisher then. <laughs> I wish. I wish it was. Uh, hey, that's, you know, unfortunately that's a it belt. Wasn't, uh, yeah. That's an absolute belter. Um, <laughs> changing, <laughs> that's brilliant. Changing the theme brilliant. slightly. Um, you were born in Dominica in the West Indies. Was there any ever any thoughts or any contact with the West Indies at all? No, not not at all. I mean, it was it was a strange one because I, I I spoke to someone earlier um, about I think it's about a month ago. And we were going through um, my upbringing and everything else, and. You know, I was born in Dominica, which is um, the, the French island. Everyone thinks it's Dominica Republic, but it's actually Dominica. The, the, Dominica. It's between the, the two French islands, Guadeloupe and Martinique. Beautiful and, island. I've yeah, I mean, it's lovely. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's pleasant. It's very, you know, it's like going back, you know, years, basically. It's natural. And I, you know, my only memories of it was, you know, sort of a little boy and in the you know, village, and that was it. Now, what people didn't know about me um, was... My parents, I'm one of seven boys, you know, oh, wow. some, yeah, seven boys. So I'm fifth in line. Now, all my, there's my brother Ruben and myself, uh, we, was, we were left in Dominica. So my mum used to, you know, so mum and dad were in England and they used to, you know, sort of bring us up bit by bit. And Ruben and myself were the last two. So basically, for the last, you know, I'm, the, I'm thinking about it now and it really sort of gets me, I can't believe it. From the age of six to eight, my grandmother looked after me. So I was, I was with my grandmother and, my, and Ruben. So, you know, we were in Dominica. And I'll never forget where we drove from the village to, I think it's um, Melvin Hall, the airport, which is about two hours drive. And we're in this, you know, with taxi or whatever. My grandmother's put us in this taxi. We're on our own and I'm with my little brother. And sort of that, you know, can you imagine that? I mean, so it's, you know, seven or eight. And I, we sat together and we, you know, we, we're getting ready and we, we're leaving and we're driving for two hours so you can go into this airport. So we get to this airport and it's all, you know, it's frightening, you know, at that age. And I remember going into the airport and then we looked in, we put into this room and then suddenly this big plane came in this, Leo, you know, it's only a tiny one, the Liat ones, but it looked to us, yeah. it was massive. So it came in and then someone took us, put us onto this plane and we drove, yeah, something not drove, sorry, we flew from uh, Dominica to Antigua. Landed Antigua, I mean, I'm, you know, you're talking about I'm seven, seven, eight years old, basically. Uh, you know, going to Antigua, we got put into this room and we sat there for, you know, I don't know, it might have been two, three, four hours at, uh, until the next flight. And we just sat in this room, literally, we're thinking, what's going on? Can you imagine how scary that was? Wow. And I'm, I'm thinking about it now. And then suddenly we then put onto this big British Airways, this massive plane, as far as I can see. Yeah. And we sat in the back, you know, and the stewardess has just got us some, you know, crayons and whatever. And we just had this little bag and we sat there thinking, where are we going? And then next thing you know, we, we fell asleep. Uh, and I felt, woke up in the morning as we landed into, you know, London. And I, and I looked out the window and it was just like, where the hell are we? It was just grey, foggy, cold, horrible. You know, my you know, last time I looked out and there was a beach, there was a sea, and then suddenly you've got this foggy, grey, you know, and I'm like, I'm I'm with Ruben and we sort of cuddling each other, thinking scared basically. And eventually my dad and one of my brothers picked us up. And I was you know, when we were driving, you know, sort of back, you know, going to back to North London, wherever, you know, they lived. And I'm thinking, where are we? And it was just alien to me. And, you know, sort of, you, 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 you know, sort of got it coming to England. I came to England at the age of seven, eight, um, didn't know any different. And then when I started to junior school, now the thing that most people didn't know, my first language basically 
is broken friends patois right and okay. i swear right. yeah really? yeah it's broken really? friends. yeah so i you know i was very strong my language is very strong because scott said where we are is very you know it's, it's sort of uh down the bottom it's next to you know sort of guadalupe martinique one of them and it's very french it's very uh, so we yeah. spoke patois so in the classroom you know sort of Occasionally things used to, you know, be said and I, I'd answer and, and everyone used to laugh at me because of the broken French accent or the way I spoke. And that really destroyed me, absolutely destroyed me. And, mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I, I remember doing, I, and I regret it really, and I just say it's so important at school where people, you know, people might be having different problems and you, you make sure you don't bully them or do anything like that without, you know, without realising. And, and I lost, I lost um, my ex and I wanted to lose the, 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 the patois completely. And I lost it and I, I can't even, I understand the odd French word now. I can't even speak it. My, my parents, wow. my brothers, they all do it and I can't. Uh, so my memory of Dominica was destroyed because of, you know, bullying at school basically. Wow. And, and you talked about the West Indies, did they, you know, I had no, there was no, no thoughts. It was basically, I was, you know, I, I learnt my cricket in England. I schooled in England, and this is where I played my cricket. So, um, yeah, I might have been born there, but at the end of the day, it was it was England the way I was going to play my cricket. But that you know experience as a youngster uh, was very very tough, really really hard. Uh, so, so interesting, so yeah. interesting and, story. Yeah, I mean, yeah. also as well as well, Phil. You, you know, this this year, this this summer has been really weird for you know, obviously the obvious reasons. But you know, England versus West Indies this time round in the bubble, that added added significant sort yeah. of role in in the Black Lives Matter as well, which I, I know is something that you've spoken about and and uh, you know very you know speak brilliantly on it actually. Um, was that something that really you know you were you were conscious of? I mean, what kind of age were you when you became conscious of of that being being an issue you know what was it what was it like what was it like in cricket in the 90s I mean we've come a long way but what what, what was that what was that like for you what was your experiences of all that um you know look we I I always look uh, positive to to what's happened in my career I was you know very much look at the great things I try not to look at the negatives but sometimes you know it, you just can't help it you have to let people know exactly what you went through. Um, my experience is, you know, sort of growing up and playing cricket, you know, some of it was really tough. It was really hard. And we, we spoke about it early doors. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, anything that kept me, my mum was very, you know, was my mum was special to me because she was the one that kept me going and always kept saying to me, look, you've always got to remember this is what you want to do and don't let anyone you know, stop you from doing it. Um, racism, yeah, I look, I experienced racism when I was growing up and in, in cricket itself. Um, it was done in, sometimes it's sneakily done. Uh, there were things that were said in the change room and you know you could look around, you could look at that player and go, mate, I know you, what you're saying, you really mean it. Where, so, where in the change room is, is a great place to have a bit of banter as well, which is great, great fun. And, and, and the players, you know, the players who, who say, and you, look, you get away with it because we're mates, you know, but there's certain players who say, it and you just think, you know, you know, full well, this is meant, this yeah. is not fun. This is not a joke. And, and there, there are one or two, you know, players who I've sort of, you know, went through that period with and, uh, uh, and you, you try to ignore it, but you've always kept to the back of your mind. You always know about that player. Um, so you you know you're very aware of that experiences um you know there's there's a, there's one thing which i always you know never forget i'll never forget that really and it's something which was quite frightening for me was receiving letters from the national front wow. and um saying to me you know if i appeared or turned out to play for england um get a sniper do they shoot you uh, we know where your family is. We'll burn, you know, we'll yeah. burn your house. Um, you know, we're talking about police looking after my house, my family, um, you know, and my sponsored car sort of disappearing the name coming off and driving down. I, no, you know, no, I played, I would have played possibly five or six test matches 
with that in the back of my mind. Uh, wow. Can you imagine stepping out and playing for for your country and thinking, you know, I could be, you know, shot there and then, thinking that way. But one of the things, you know, again, you, you know, I spoke to my mum and she just said, look, you just you can't let these people win. You just got to play. And I did, and I, I did that. But it was a horrible experience. Really, really horrible experience. Just in the um, Yeah, and look, yeah, as you know, as, as a youngster, again, you know, brought up in North London, you, you going for, you know, sort of representative cricket trials and that, you know, you always, you pushed aside and, and partly I thought, well, it was a school I went to. I went to a state school, uh, Wilsden High, and I thought, well, it must be the Wilsden High state school. And and then it's only, you know, at t- I, I, ne- I never wanted to say because it was my colour. Um, I never wanted to do that. I always thought, well, maybe it's the school I went to, state school. But at times you felt, you know, is it? You know, why, yeah. you know, why am I being pushed aside? And, and I was, and with my mum, you know, I was speaking to mum, she says, oh, it's most of the school you went to. My mum always looked at it that way. And I went, okay, fair enough, mum. But you don't know. And, I, I, you know, and it, it's one of those, really. Um, yeah. But yeah, look, mate, yeah, we've, we've all, it doesn't matter what colour you are, we've all gone through horrible times. Um, and I just, you know, I just think it's wrong. I, 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 you know, how can you judge someone by the colour of the skin? Um, you know, which is, to me, which is horrendous, really. And, you know, that the first, my first experience, basically, of um, proper experience of, of, of racism was we played against Yorkshire, funny enough, for see at Middlesbrough. Uh, we played against Yorkshire, Middlesbrough. And... You know, I don't know if it was racism or it was just, you know, just uneducated idiots, basically. I, I don't know what it is, really. And, and I remember fielding on the boundary and um, there were bananas being thrown at me. There was loads wow. of bananas thrown at me. <laughs> and I was, I remember I was, I was 18, 18 then. And they're thrown at me and I, I, I walked out and, you know, sort of came in and I was in tears. I remember being in tears. I was crying. And David Gow was captain. Um, you know, and we had Winston Benjamin playing in, you know, as an overseas player. And Benji came up to me and said, look, mate, let's swap. You come in, in a ring and I'll go out. So he went out and I came in the inner ring. I was, in, I, was, I was in tears, really tears. It really affected me. And um, Winston went, went to the boundary. I looked at Benji and I was still throwing bananas. <laughs> Benji picked a banana up, peeled it, ate it, threw it back and it went, cheers. And I thought, what a way to beat them. Yeah, you know, and I yeah. never forgot that. And I thought, fantastic. And Benji did that. And I'll never, ever forgotten that. So yeah. moving on from then on, whenever I had, you know, issues, I sort of, you know, you know, ignored it and just remember what Benji did. But we all go through those things. You know, I, I had issues in, in Australia um, where, you know, kids shouting, you're pommy this, or you're pommy that. And, you know, and, and you're like this, aren't you? You, you just can't. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a lot of things you can't, you just can't react. Um, but there is a lot of dreadful things that happen. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, we play the sport we love and you can't let these people stop you from doing it. No, Do exactly. What, what happened, what's happened this summer has been a, a spark for, for change, for good, for the future. Obviously, it's, it's not soon enough, really, but is it the start of a positive movement, do you feel? Well, it is. The, the, the thing that we mustn't, you, you know, each, each, you know, maybe three, four years, you get an incident that stirs yeah. it all up. And, you know, I'm, I'm not for, you know, you know, people writing and everything, uh, you know, saying this is what, you know, it, this is not the way you do it. What we must do is, you know, look, take it on board and say, look, we've got to stop this. We've got to find a way of doing, of educating people and, you know, and making sure these things don't happen again. Um, you know, and look, I'm, I'm not in a position, I'm not, excuse the term, I'm not bright enough to, to find the answers and do all those things, you know, but all I can say from my experiences, um, you know, we, we have to educate and we have to change, you know, the, you know, the thinking and how people are. And a lot of it is basically, it's from home. It's, you know, it's, it's at home. It's what you teach your kids at home. Um, yeah. And that's, that's where it is. It's simple as that, really. It's what you teach your kids at home. You know, if you, if you're in a family where, uh, the, you know the the n word or whatever is being said all the time. Your kids are naturally going to do that if you keep saying so and so. Doesn't matter. By the way, it doesn't matter what color you are. You could be, you know, against 
ginger, whoever, whatever, you know. Um, and then if, if you're doing that at home, it naturally carries on, doesn't it? Um, and so we've got to, it's basically, I think it starts from home and then we've just got to educate you know, each other really and our kids and moving forward. And hopefully a generation moving forward, you, you don't have those things. Yeah, well said, well said, yeah, Daffy. Absolutely, yeah. Really powerful um, message that, Daffy. Thanks very much for that. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully Thank this you resonates. Very much. If anyone's listening, they can um, take that Absolutely. on board as well and, and spread the message as well. Absolutely. Well said. Well said, Daffy. Um, just wrapping things up, you've been really good with us. You've given us an hour of your time out of your busy Definitely. schedule. What, what is a busy schedule for, for, for you, Daffy? What is What are you up to at the moment? Do you still love cricket when it's on? Do you still watch it? Do you still, you know, what, what talk to me about your relationship with cricket now? With cricket? I'm still, I'm still involved with cricket, yeah. Um, I, I sort of help out the Leicestershire Academy. Nice. So I coach with the Leicestershire Academy boys um which i love um i enjoy that and you know and also i'm sort of director of cricket at london school cricket association Lovely. so again you know we've just been through this process during the summer of trialing over 700 boys um, wow. where before because i you know we, we go back i'm a london i'm a london boy i'm a you know london school boy and you know how london school were back then to me, things never changed. It was all the same. And I wanted to make a difference. And we've done that. And we've, we've reached out to, we're trying to unearth, you know, talented kids, kids, kids from state schools, kids who, who wouldn't get the opportunity. So we've done that. And we had trials for 700 boys, which great support from the PC, uh, from the ECB, um, you know, which has been fantastic. And, you know, I, I, you know, I was doing that. We've done that. We've gone through. It's a shame, really. Now we've got lockdown where I went to programme. We haven't been able to, we've, we managed to get a couple of sessions in, but that's about it really. And yeah. then it's, it's locked down till Christmas, basically. Yeah. Uh, so at the moment I'm sort of twiddling my thumbs and I'm, I'm just about to go for a run, funny enough. Um, <laughs> and that's it. And then I'm a taxi driver for the school run at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, so, so that's what it is really at the moment. Yeah. I, well, I, I hope you haven't necked a Fanta before you go for your run, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, careful. <laughs> Water, water. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Yeah, cool, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough at the moment, and you know the the weird thing is, my you know kids are still at school, but you know we can't they, they can't have any sessions, so it's one of them really. It'll all sort itself out, hopefully. Yeah. Um, it's it's really it's really good to you know to give us so much of your time and talk to us and be yeah brilliant. Thanks so much. I could talk to you for another hour, mate. Yeah. Can... No, 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 no problem, Brooksy. How are you recovering, mate? Um, you can't see right now, but I've got this on my yeah. hand because my thumb was repaired after the Lord's game, and I'm I'm on my bed at the minute with. Can right you show foot. us? Can you show us? Because it's a video podcast as well. <laughs> Oh, no. lovely! Well, I'm in, I'm in my pants just for you in bed with my feet up. Um, be a few more weeks yet before I'm back on my feet properly, but hopefully next year will be uh, be all right. I'll get back to somewhere near what I'm capable of. So. Good Busy. man, well, speedy recovery, mate. Thanks, Daffy. Yeah, appreciate it, mate. Brilliant. No worries. Top stuff. Cheers. Take it Cheers, easy, guys. Really good to talk to you. Thanks and, uh, so much for coming. See you at cricket ground next summer or something. All right. Look forward to it. Take care, guys. Look after yourself. Oh, man. Yeah, Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Cheers, 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 Cheers. Cheers. See you later.